So after getting COVID, starting school, and scrapping two separate video ideas, I'm finally back and I'm here to make an add-on to the disturbing police sketches video that a lot of people seem to enjoy as of late. This video is going to be focusing on the Mr. Cruel case, so if you aren't familiar with the case or haven't watched my police sketches video, then you can go watch that or just watch the Mr. Cruel section, which I'll put some timestamps up on screen for right now. Alright, so this topic was suggested to me by a commenter named Jolt, who mentioned a Reddit post about someone claiming that they were raised by Mr. Cruel, which obviously is intriguing to me because I had never heard of this. This user goes by the name u slash corrupted and has had a Reddit account since February 23rd, 2020. The post we're going to be looking at today was posted to r slash unsolved mysteries on June 11th, 2021. As a little refresher, Mr. Cruel was a serial child that was active in Melbourne, Australia during the 80s and 90s. He had three confirmed victims, age 11, 10, and 13, and is suspected to have killed 13-year-old Carmen Chan. Mr. Cruel is most known for the balaclava he wears, which can be seen in his disturbing police sketches. Alright, now on to the post. Hi fellow Redditors. Not too sure if this is where I should be, or even if I should be posting this. It's been on my mind for many decades now at least 30 plus years and it has always terrified me. Although I have no definitive evidence, the coincidences are just too much. To start with, I'm only mentioning all of this because I know it's anonymous, and if it wasn't, then there is no way I would ever consider mentioning any of this in a public forum. I grew up in an extremely abusive household. My mother displays narcissistic personality disorder, my stepfather is a and his oldest son is an alcoholic, a compulsive liar, and also a Sadly, I know this from first-hand experience, and I also know that I am not the only person that was afflicted by their attentions. My mother did nothing about the situation. In fact, she often put me in compromising positions deliberately, leaving me in their custody or turning a blind eye when she had undeniable evidence that something had occurred. Although this subreddit is about unsolved murders and not other forms of abuse, this will all make sense as it is all intertwined. When I was about 11 years old, I lived in the state of Tasmania in Australia. My eldest stepbrother had moved interstate to Victoria to join the army, and I was just relieved for the break from his presence. When he completed his basic training, my stepfather and my mother went for a trip to Victoria to watch my stepbrother march out which is a ceremony at the end of their training to signify that they were now full serving members of the defense force. They were gone interstate for approximately two weeks. My dates are not 100% accurate, but they were gone from about late August to somewhere in mid-September. I remember this clearly because once they came back to Tasmania, they had nothing but praise about mainland Australia. Tasmania is an island state, and they wanted to move there. We were packed and ready to move very fast, and were gone in just over two weeks after their return. We arrived in Melbourne on the 5th of October, 1987. Not long after we moved to Melbourne, there was an awful case on the news about a man who was abducting young girls from their homes and abusing them. One of his last victims that I was aware of was a young girl named Carmen Chan. Although I was so young at the time and often ignored whatever stories were on the news at night time, this stuck with me because we often ate dinner with the television on at the same time. Whenever something came on the news about Carmen Chan and the abductor that the media had dubbed Mr. Cruel, my stepfather would snap at me and insist that I shut up and keep quiet while he listened. He would turn the television up louder and become very focused on whatever the news was reporting. Mr. Cruel had abducted a few girls leading up to this point, and had mostly just assaulted them before he left them somewhere where they would be discovered and returned to their families. In Carmen Chan's case, however, she was never returned and eventually was found deceased. My stepfather's abnormally intense interest in the news surrounding these cases always confused me, as he most certainly did not concern himself with my welfare, and there was plenty of violent news on television for him to absorb, so I had no idea why he was so interested in Mr. Cruel. He did have some other peculiar interests, as he used to own a collection of booklets printed about serial killers in our home library. I did not read them all, as I was too young and had no interest in the subject at the time, but I remember a book about Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, etc. Of course, this is not illegal to possess and on its own, not entirely suspicious, but if you combine it with the rest of my post, then perhaps it will appear to be a little dubious. 
Anyways, it wasn't until I was much older that I started to question why my stepfather seemed so interested in Mr. Cruel at the time. That's when I started to read up on what little information the police had on the murderer. They believed that he was in the defense force, I think because of the way he was so clean and left behind no evidence or minimal evidence. At the time of these abductions and murders, my stepbrother was in the army, but my stepfather was also a manic neat freak. He would make me wash the hubcaps of the car with a toothbrush when I was cleaning it, and one day he even went on a meltdown because I left a tiny ink mark on the front page of the newspaper while I was checking to see if a pen was working. His tidiness was compulsive. The one piece of physical evidence that Mr. Cruel left behind was a whisker, so the police thought that they were looking for a redhead because the whisker was red. Both my stepfather and stepbrother are brunettes, unless they grow facial hair, then they both have red facial hair. The police also thought that their suspect was from either Tasmania or New Zealand, due to the same colloquial language that the abducted girls heard. I cannot recall the exact phrase that was released to the media, I just know that when I read it at the time, I recognized it as something my stepfather and stepbrother used. They often used colloquialisms such as, how do you like them apples, or how does that grab you, in a sadistic, condescending tone. These are just a couple of the many that they used. Also, at the time of the abductions and abuse slash murder, all of the victims were female and all of them were the same age as myself. The last bit of evidence that comes to mind at the moment is the timeline. From what I read in the media, they believed that the first abductions from Mr. Cruel occurred sometime in either late August to mid-September 1987. I cannot recall the exact date, I just remember how ill it made me feel to know that both my stepfather and my stepbrother were both in Victoria at the time this happened. And the last victim believed to be abducted by Mr. Cruel was either in September or very early October in 1992. These dates are important because against my wishes and my stepfather's wishes, my mother insisted we move back to Tasmania and we left Victoria on October the 5th, 1992, just after Mr. Cruel's last apparent abduction before he went quiet in Victoria. Around the same time that we moved back to Tasmania, my stepbrother moved from Victoria to Queensland, so now both my stepfather and stepbrother were no longer in Victoria although both of them had been there during the times that Mr. Cruel was active. Both my stepfather and stepbrother had a sadistic streak, and I honestly believe that after living with them for 13 years, either one of them was quite capable of doing those acts. My stepbrother was, however, a little skittish and anxious when he was being abusive, but my stepfather always kept his composure. At the times that Mr. Cruel was active, we lived in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, which is where Carmen Chan's body was found, and so did my stepbrother. Her body was found only a couple of suburbs away from where we resided. My stepfather does not appear to fit the physical description of Mr. Cruel, as he is quite short, but my stepbrother does. It would not even surprise me if they acted, if it was them, as a pair, because each of them knew of the other's sadistic behaviors and each of them covered for the other. At the time that Mr. Cruel was active, I would also like to note that at least one of his victims stated that they could hear airplanes overhead when they were abducted. We lived in the northern suburbs of Melbourne at the time, not too far from an international airport and underneath the flight paths of many of the planes. Also, one of the descriptions of a room that one of the girls was kept in matches up with what I can remember from one of my stepbrother's rooms when he was living out of our home for a while. My stepbrother never lived in barracks when he moved to Melbourne. He either rented his room or moved back in with us for a while. The only time I recall that he lived on a base was just before we moved back to Tasmania. At this time, he was married and was working as a chef at a communications depot. Because this depot was so small and in a rural area, and because he was married, he was provided a house on the depot site to live in with his wife of the time. Because he was a chef and the depot was so small, he was the only chef that I was aware of, so he needed to be available on site to cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So living at the depot was pretty essential. I also recall his odd behavior, which may not have anything to do with this case, but it was not uncommon to find him vacuuming his house or hanging clothes out in the back to dry at 1am. This may have just had to do with his weird working hours, but he was definitely an extreme neat freak and I hated spending time there to keep his wife company 
because as a 16 year old I did not appreciate being woken up to help vacuum or hang the washing up so late at night. I mentioned all of this to a police officer years ago. All I can recall was that she was part of a task force at the time. She did ask me to get back to her, but I had a house fire and lost her contact details. Since then, I haven't been able to locate her, and I have no idea what her name was. I don't remember, although I wish I did. I truly believe that one of them, if not both of them, were involved in this whole Mr. Cruel incident. It terrifies me to think that perhaps their dislike for me, or their passion to be sadistic towards myself is possibly why they chose targets that were brunettes and of the same age as myself. There is a saying in Australia, which is you don't f where you eat, which means if you're going to commit a crime, you don't do it in your backyard, because it's just too close to home. So the thought of them lashing out at these young ladies instead of myself is just sickening. Of course, I have no definite proof of me, or they slash he, would most certainly be in prison as I type this. I have nothing to do with them at all anymore. Concerning the abuse I faced, my mother once told me when I was 14 that if I were ever to go to the police, she would lie about what happened, and then asked me who I thought a judge would believe, her or a teenage girl. I was terrified to go to the authorities because I thought no one would believe me, and then the aftermath would be much worse for me. Since then, however, I've had my stepbrother charged, and he did end up spending some time in jail for some of the crimes committed against me, although most of them have gone unpunished. I don't hold any malice about that and am impressed that the Victorian police were able to put together a case on what information they had and that they were able to charge him at all. This does not alleviate my concerns about the Mr. Cruel case, though. There are so many coincidences that I find frightening. 1. The intense interest in the media coverage of the cases. 2. All the victims were the same age and same hair color as myself. 3. Living in the approximate area where he was committing the crimes. 4. Their facial hair is the same as the sample found at the crime scene. 5. There are colloquialisms that match Mr. Cruel's pattern of speech. 6. The time frames that Mr. Cruel was committing his crimes matched the times that both of my family members were in Victoria. 7. Living in the northern suburbs, we live close to an international airport and underneath the flight path of airplanes. 8. My stepfather's compulsion for tidiness and my stepbrother being in the army at the time of Mr. Cruel's spree. 9. Mr. Cruel's activities seemed to cease when both my stepfather and stepbrother moved interstate from Victoria. 10. My stepfather's fascination with serial killers. 11. My family came from Tasmania, as the police believed that Mr. Cruel was either Tasmanian or from New Zealand. I guess all these coincidences don't amount to a criminal case, but it has left me feeling ill, terrified, and with no one to talk to about this. I did try to mention it to my biological father once a few years ago, but I think he just thought perhaps I was overreacting, as he was not aware of the abuse I had endured as a child. I had never told him about any of this, even when my stepbrother was charged and went to jail. My biological father had no idea why and had no idea that my mother was aware, and that his father was also a part of it all. I can't shake the horrible feeling that I feel like I was raised by a serial abuser. Well that one I know is a certainty, and a murderer, who had no problem in taking the life of a young girl. I know that either of them is capable of such actions, although if I was asked to choose which one I thought, it would most likely be the physical attributes match my stepbrother, but the calmness of Mr. Cruel is something that was more often displayed by my stepfather, so I don't know. But I am very sure that one of them, if not both of them, were involved in this case. I just don't know who to approach or who will take all this seriously. I also have a family of my own now, and I don't want them to hear about any of it. I have to be careful because I don't want to expose my children to these kinds of images and thoughts. Lastly, I would just like to add for those who question whether or not my thought processes about this situation are stable, I had to be psychologically assessed as part of the legal requirements when I had charges pressed against my stepbrother. The courts needed to assure that the person making these kinds of allegations is mentally aware of their accusations, and that there is no sign of mental illness where they may have misinterpreted a situation. Yes, there are psychological effects. I suffer from PTSD, but honestly, if you knew the true horrors of the home I grew up with, then you would be amazed if anyone could endure such an upbringing and walk out of that home without any emotional baggage. 
If anyone who reads this knows of a person amongst the Victorian police task force who would be interested in talking with me, I have no problems with this and would appreciate a way to contact them. As I type this, I am sitting here shaking. As I recall my old home with those poor girls who had to endure and poor Carmen who probably did nothing wrong other than to view his face, my heart goes out to her family. But I am so scared that her family would bear a grudge against me. Although I had nothing to do with the whole situation and was the same age as Carmen, grief can make someone view perspectives differently. I would be ashamed to face them unless I was able to assist in them getting some kind of justice. I have not mentioned any names, other than that of Carmen Chan who was one of his victims. I have not mentioned exact suburbs or exact information, as if this is of the interest to the police. I don't want to jeopardize any possible investigation and outcome by posting information publicly before an official investigation is done. Nor do I want to cause any possible biased opinions, as this could affect the outcome of a court hearing. I am not saying that my step-family members will ever be charged, go to court, or that they are guilty, but I will not take the risk of ruining any chances of possible justice just so I can tell my story on Reddit. Thanks for reading. Perhaps someone will respond with some kind of information or advice. As I see it, there are three possibilities concerning the validity of this post. The first is that OP is lying. The second is that OP is telling the truth and lived with Mr. Cruel. And the third is that OP is telling the truth, but the connections with Mr. Cruel are coincidental. Let's talk about the first theory. Know that I am not calling OP a liar. I'm not going to sit here and tell someone that they are lying about being abused. However, when you're investigating something online, the possibility that someone might be lying should never be ruled out. It's extremely easy to lie online, so of course some people are going to lie for one reason or another. I think most people would feel bad lying about something this serious, but I wouldn't put it past anyone online to do so. Again, not calling OP a liar, but I'd be amiss not to mention this theory. To be honest, this post doesn't strike me as fake. It's not exactly written in this certain narrative style that makes you think, oh yeah, I'm reading a story, which I've definitely seen some of those in my day. So let's say that OP is telling the truth, then that brings us to the second and third theories. Are the connections between OP's family and Mr. Cruel real, or just a coincidence? Now, this was a long time ago, so I'm sure that a few details in OP's story might be a bit off. OP even commented that they were trying not to consume media concerning the case out of fear of mixing up details between both stories. But if we believe it for the most part, then we can make some educated guesses. From what I've seen in the comment sections of OP's post, most people believe that this person could genuinely be related to Mr. Cruel, whether it's OP's stepdad, stepbrother, or both. I think that the most important parts that OP brought up were the location, the time frame, and the behavior. As OP mentioned, the area and time frame in which the murders took place line up with their family moving to Melbourne, specifically near where Mr. Cruel's crimes took place, and near an airport. We also learned from OP that their stepfather and stepbrother were abusive and no strangers to committing crimes. Again, you can also choose to believe that these connections are just coincidences. One tidbit of information is OP's post history consists of posts that back up their story of an abusive mother and having PTSD, so take that as you will. For over a year now, you slash corrupted has been inactive, but they left us with one bit of information that might tell us why in their post titled support. Not too sure if this is where I should make this post, but I want to ensure as many people could see it as possible. I made a post yesterday about possibly having Mr. Cruel as a member of my extended family, and the support and responses were slash are overwhelming. I want to thank everyone who took the time to read my post and to send messages of support or share their opinions or question me further. As the responses were a lot more than what I had expected, I find myself struggling to keep up with everything, so there is a possibility that I have missed a couple at present. Right now though, I wanted to take some time out to type up a thorough email so that I could send this information that I do have to the authorities, and because of this, I probably won't be responding to any further replies immediately slash currently. I do want to inform you all though, that fellow Redditors have been amazing. Anyone who can find faults in my post and who disagrees with my coincidence theory, I encourage you to let me know. Any criticism is welcomed, as long as it is constructive. I do not claim that I am completely positive that they were slash are involved, I just wanted to express my concerns and explain why. 
I thank everyone who has been involved, you all have been great. Again, I will respond to any messages I have missed in due time. Just not too sure how long that will be because I know that the email I need to type up will take some time, and must be as accurate and thorough as possible. I am not great at multitasking, which is why I am going to devote my time to this email as a priority. Thanks again, you guys are the best. So OP mentions that as of June 13th, 2021, when this was posted, they were writing up an email to the authorities. If some sort of police investigations were actually opened up for Mr. Cruel, then I doubt OP could post updates about it on Reddit, and they even said that they wouldn't do that. So this could explain why they've been gone for over a year, or maybe they're just gone for unrelated reasons. Ultimately, it's up to you to decide whether or not you believe that you slash corrupted is related to Mr. Cruel. I'm interested to hear what you all think, but what do I think? I'm inclined to believe that OP is telling the truth. As I said, nothing about this post strikes me as fake. I know skeptics will disagree with me, but as of writing this script, I don't think OP was lying about their story. Whether or not they're actually related to Mr. Cruel is a different question that I can neither confirm nor deny because I just don't know. Maybe it's a bunch of coincidences, or maybe not. As OP said, feel free to poke holes in their timeline or point out any other faults in their story because I haven't seen many people on Reddit try to challenge it. I know the account has been abandoned for a year, but I hope that you slash corrupted might stumble upon this video and give us a bit of an update if possible. Anyways, it's good to be back, thank you for watching, thank you for 9000, and as always, good night.